Hi. Hello, hello, hello. We're here. Uh, so if you don't know me, I'm Pip. And every week we get on here and we have a great discussion about something amazing. I own a search and social uh, digital media marketing agency. And my cohort, wait for it. Let me see if I can find him. Uh-oh. Greg, I've lost you. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Hold on. Hold on. There People you are. Don't my face anyways. Hey, Greg. Greg. Hey, everyone. I am Greg McKinnon, and I run Original 72 Creative, and we're a full-service website graphic design and digital marketing firm in Vancouver. And our powers combined, we talk about something fun and amazing. So today, Greg, what are we talking about? We are talking about feature creep, scope creep, same thing. Right. Basically, those little things that a client asks for that weren't in an original proposal that you quoted. Right. Scope creep. It is the pain we all feel at times, especially running little agencies. Arlene is here. Hello, Arlene, and welcome. Um, I'm sure other people will pop in as we get into it. But, Greg, the five things we're going to cover today are... Um, uh, well, we have five ways to manage scope creep, but we're going to talk about timelines and milestones and uh, costs because those are the two things that are included with scope creep. So our first, our first uh, way to stop scope creep is uh, saying no is an answer. No is a full sentence. No is something smart to say. Well, I would say actually the first thing would be to have a clearly defined set of uh, tasks or project um, scope that you will be completing, completed for whatever it is you said you would do that work for. Right. Second would be saying no when something that's not defined in that is asked for. <laughs> right, so the stop being a yes person. No, I'm bad at this because I really like to be helpful. Like, and I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, we could do that. Oh yeah, like, um, so for instance, today uh, we have a client who has clients and she, uh, I mean, we said yes because, uh, so we were asked to meet to explain reporting. Now, is that scope creep? Uh, we've already explained it once to the person we send it to, but should we be explaining it to the owners? And if we do, do we charge more for that? So today we did that um, just to be kind because it does help our business. But was it a little bit of scope creep? Yes, in fact, it was. So, uh, you know, and yes, I said yes. So you were doing something for a client, but they also have clients and you carried over to do what you were doing for them for some of their clients? Let me explain that better. So we have um, an agency that's hired us out um, to do some work for them, right? So we provide that agency with the report. Now, in order for her client to understand the report, she asked us to get on a phone with the actual client, Right. So not something we were planning to do. We weren't even planning to ever meet the client. Right. So it kind of did jump that barrier. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, does it make us look better? Yes. Yeah. So scope creep, I think, is something that um, has to be done on a case by case basis. Right. But besides having everything laid out. Hey, Paul. Yay, you're here. Um, but besides having everything laid out in your plan, because we know that, you know, Clients sign contracts and some of them don't read them, right? And then all of a sudden, I mean, one of our first biggest clients, like literally, and they were in Toronto. It was one of the most painful things we ever dealt with. They signed the contract. They did not read it. And we know that because they didn't read the terms and conditions. So number one. Number two, they were calling us at their 9 a.m., which was our 6 a.m. And they were asking, like, we, it was like jump through hoops over and over again. It was crazy. Like crazy um mm -hmm. and and we well we wanted the money and it was what in our beginning so we said yes a lot and then it got to the point where it was like you know we, we need to let these people go this is not what they hired us to do they're trying to take our information they're not treating us with respect so i think that's a big thing about scope creep that clients don't understand that 
it is somewhat related to respecting your own boundaries and respecting theirs, right? Mm -hmm. I, it's really interesting. So tell us, guys, have you guys had scope creep? Uh, we want to hear your stories because I have a few. Greg's been in this in this longer than me, so he, you know, lays out everything fine-tuned detail. Now, Greg, what happens if a client asks you for something extra or additional or, yeah? Well, with with the project um, being well-defined in what we are going to produce, if anything gets asked for in addition to what we've talked about um, producing for this client, mm -hmm. gives me the opportunity to say, we can absolutely do that. It's not something that we initially discussed and therefore isn't reflected in the cost of what we're doing for you and may result in additional time or, or charges um, for the project. Mm -hmm. It opens the door to at least have that discussion um, because you have that defined uh, up front so that you can you can handle it that way as opposed to you know if someone came to me and said I want a website I said, sure, typically my range is this to this. Sounds great. Let's do it. And then, you know, I'm producing a website, which is huge. Like, who knows what is involved in this website? Is it e-commerce? Is it, you know, some um, customer portal? Like, it's so wide open that you are now locked in to sort of creating a site with, no specs mm. and what that will do is at some point i'll be like shit i'm making no money because this guy wants the, the world and i'll have a bad taste in my mouth i'll be going to him and say listen i need more i need more money to be doing this and he'll be like well mm, no because you said you'd do it for this it creates conflict so you, you can eliminate all that and have a civil discussion on this is what we were doing you've now introduce this new thing we can absolutely do it this is how much more it's going to cost how much more time it's going to why take. yeah because of more time right yeah okay, that's the thing dell is here miriam is here is that how you say your name um hi guys yay and welcome and to the others that have joined us so i think that's really interesting you know uh kind of like so there's an analogy for a party you know say and i had this experience so had a party invited one of our neighbors and like, he wouldn't leave <laughs> like at the end, right? And it's like, you want to say something like, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Um, but you're afraid to say it because you don't want to hurt feeling similar to clients. You, you know, maybe we pussyfoot around because um, we don't want to make waves. And maybe sometimes we think it's easier just to, just to do it. But I think it's important to have the discussion, right? Like... I think it's essential. So the first, okay, the second one, because Greg added in the, like, you know, have an outline. Um, so we had stop being a guest person and then stop, um, have a clearly defined project scope. Greg, I had that as number two. Number two. I changed it to number one because it <laughs> is number one. So let's move on because we just talked about it's that. True. So number two is not number one. It's saying no. No. Number two, saying no is it number two because you have that well-defined scope you can say no you know what you're doing yeah no so, a question though what if you're just starting out in business like and you're in the beginning so you started an agency and you don't know what you don't know so sometimes you don't know how long it's going to take so would you still yeah still clearly define the project that's a that's a completely different topic which may be good to get into in a in a future geek speak but um are you when you have project scope defined are you quoting it properly are you capturing um effectively all of the time it's going to take for you to complete that project right and are you here's another thing so if you aren't doing that then how do you know for the next time too right mm -hmm. 
So it's always good to track time. Ooh. You will you will learn. I mean, I've had my fair share of uh, quotes that have gone out, and and when I started producing the you know the work, I realized shit. I this is not what I thought. I need to do. It's taking me more time. Yeah. That, you can't you can't recover um, those costs from the customer unless you have some type of thing defined in your quote that, that specifically says there's an unknown piece here mm-hmm. that we need to to do. Ooh, that's- we don't know we don't know exactly how much effort it's going to take, but maybe there's a range. Well, and this is a thing about maybe revisiting contract. Like for instance, if you have a three month contract. And then you go to month to month, maybe it's better to just, you know, revisit it every three months and, you know, change the parameters of that. So, you know, I think a lot of it relates to being able and willing to have discussions that you need to have and not being afraid. So, Mm -hmm. yes, the clear, so clearly defined scope, not being a yes person. So that means being able to say no. Um, No is a full sentence. And no is a good answer sometimes, right? You put an exclamation on it and it's a full sentence. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So plan for changes in the project. This is really interesting. So, um, yeah. So a good way to plan for changes in the project is meet your client monthly. Not only does that create a bond and, you know, it's a better way to strategize, right? What do you guys think? Uh, Paul, are you here? How do you strategize with your client and how do you deal with scope creep besides just Yeah, it, it depends probably on uh, on the projects. I mean, I, I relate everything to web. So um, having that uh, project scope um, and revisiting the status of the development on certain time through the project life cycle. Um, obviously you're having discussions with your, your client status of, of where things are at reviews on designs or what have you. Um, and, and all of, all of that correspondence with your client is going to lead to potentially them adding something new Mm. saying, Oh, because you know, the client thinks they know what they want. Right. And they'll relay that to you. Um, and, for me, I try to think of as many things as possible to give them up front, like what about this, what about have you thought about that, to get as much defined. But as you go through the, the life cycle of the project, you will um, undoubtedly come up with situations where the customer all of a sudden jogs his memory on, you know what, for my business, this would be good which wasn't thought of before. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. It'll be extra. Um, Maybe let's do that in a phase two. Let's complete the initial project we um, agreed upon and file that away for future development or a future feature that we're going to add. So there's ways to handle um, the whole project, the the scope of, of work you're doing, and uh, and working with the client on maybe even adding things uh, through, maybe you'll suggest something through, but at least you can have that dialogue with the customer, and um, and know that certain things are within the current project or future project. Now, do you have something in your contracts that talk about um, changes in the contract or? You know, if it's out of scope, I think we need to add something in there just so we know what our rules are, like creating, you know, your own boundaries or parameters or something for your business, having them written down and actually putting them inside contracts is probably a good idea. Like we do a scope, we do a scope, which says what's included and what's not included in our proposals. But oftentimes, you know, down the road, we want those things that we add there included, right? I do. I do have a project um, proposal template that goes out to clients and they will sign that if they want to proceed with the project. And in that, they, um, there are, there is some wording around that. This is um, a quote based on time and effort for what's laid out in this proposal and anything not laid out in this proposal 
could um, have additional charges. So there's there's wording in everything that I've mm -hmm. done. For, to say that yeah and this doesn't just happen in agencies paul's saying some really good stuff he's saying scope creep is the hardest thing to deal with yes yes it is i'm gonna go back and read that he loves phase two i like i like the phase two idea too right so i wonder like um because you guys also so we sell pay-per-click advertising which is month over month right and seo and um uh so there's eh, is there scope creep in there yes when things change but um you know, we, so we sign one contract and then it goes month to month. I wonder what you guys do for that. Cause you know, we'd like to sign people on for a year and then we wouldn't go focusing on getting new clients all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. So we've talked about planning for changes in a project. And I think one solution is adding that to your contract. So ah, that's pretty good. But additionally, I just want to say like if you so if you have an initial contract or, or proposal that gets signed, um, have um, some type of a change request document as well that documents the new feature or the new requirement that the, you and the client have discussed adding and put a, a cost to that. And then you have the original, then you have smaller um change orders uh, to the project that have their associated costs separate. Interesting. Uh, so you have everything well defined. Paul, do you have one of those? I don't have one of those, Greg, I want yours. Um, <laughs> I'll bug you about that later. I'll be like, what is this? That's a good idea. I really like that because we have a, we have, we have had struggled with scope creep for sure. Um, even today, but you know, then I think about it and then I think, you know, when we moved in here, we got quoted by a moving company uh, and then we moved. And then when we got here, the truck wouldn't go up the hill. So literally the movers had to <laughs> had to move everything like manually. Now this cost us more money and mm -hmm. so it was scope creep. So they might've had a change request because I think the worst thing that happens is when there is scope creep, the client doesn't really understand. We haven't explained ourselves well. And all of a sudden they're getting another bill and they're pissed. Right. So if you do maybe the change request, that's a really smart idea. Right. Then there's no question. Ooh, I like that for the mover. That's sort of unforeseen costs or well known, though, that movers become un unforeseen fulfillment of what they um, what they said they would do for you. Yeah. Well, yes. And easily explained to you like our truck couldn't get up the hill or like, I... whatever. Whatever it was. Signed, right? But I mean, it is well known that moving companies, it's an estimate. It's not like, because they're basing it on hours, yeah. right? So they base yeah. it on, I think, $50 an hour for one guy, 50 for two. So if you have, you know, so it, it's pretty interesting. But so we're not the only industry that deals with this. There's probably so many others. Oh, no, every industry has this to a certain extent. And the worst thing you could you could have for your business is to always have your customer disappointed because what they were told they were going to pay is all of a sudden more expensive every time because there's something new that they're being charged. I can't stand when I go somewhere and we're, I was told that it was going to be a certain amount and I get there and all of a sudden it's more or... You know, it's yes, it's that, but there's some, you know, thing that wasn't talked about that adds on to the cost, whatever it is, it leaves a bad taste in every customer's mouth. Right. This is really interesting because this is exactly what happens on e-commerce stores, right? You purchase a product and then you go to that checkout page and you're prepared for those taxes, but you are not prepared for the shipping cost. Had they bundled that in and charged you more it'd be cool. And there wouldn't be that huge drop off. I think of shipping costs as a different beast because shipping is difficult online, especially with odd products, odd sized products. Everybody knows you have to buy something. If you buy something online, it needs to be shipped. Mm. Whatever the shipping charge is, if you're wanting that product, you're going to get charged some type of shipping. You might not like how much it is, but you know, if you want that product, you're going to, you're going to get that product. I was what I'm talking about more is like Ticketmaster, okay. where tickets are advertised. Ooh, they're this much. And then you're like, great, I'm going to buy those. And then you get to the checkout and there's a $20, 
um, this fee. fee, service fee, or online purchase fee, or some bullshit like that. Excuse the language. <laughs> Greg, but angry about this. Those, those are the things. Like, and who who buys tickets online and is not pissed off after they see? Oh yeah, I could buy two tickets to whatever concert, ninety nine dollars. In the industry, two, though, two hundred two hundred bucks for for uh, for tickets for me and my wife to go somewhere, and then all of a sudden, after taxes and fees, it's like two hundred. Sixty dollars, two hundred and seventy dollars. Yeah, so extra hundred bucks. That's crazy. That is, yeah. So I mean, how, how annoying is that? We can relate many things to scope creep. It seems they're very similar. That's interesting, Greg. Um, and you know what? They own the market, so it's not like you can go somewhere else and get tickets. Okay, so he that's that's kind of something different from a scope creep, but it pisses me off just the same. I hate right. I think you bought tickets recently, didn't you? Um, no, actually, I didn't. <laughs> Okay, so number four is communicate clearly and often. So, Greg, do you have monthly meetings with your client? Um, Z clients. Greg only has one client. It, it depends. It, it depends what I'm doing for them. Um, if it's uh, related to monthly um, advertising or marketing stuff, uh, then yes, we'll at least have a phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes an in-person uh, meeting to discuss strategy, where things are at, um, where we want to go. When it's web um, projects, or if it's a if it's a project uh, thing, then we have a timeline for the uh, start and end of that project. Mm -hmm. And throughout the life cycle of the project, we'll have milestones to um, to review designs, you know, to figure out. Um, where we're at and, and move on to the next phases and things. And those could come at any time when, when development is progressing. So do you give a timeline like outline? Um, a loose one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have like four, four phases to my development. They're, they're loosely based on that. And I have uh, some point form items that fall into each of those phases mm -hmm. and the milestones of payments um, laid out to where we are in the, in the timeline. So, yeah. Huh. Yeah, so I'm not a hard, I'm not a hardcore, like today I'm going to be doing CSS. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good. This is going to take me two days. Right. I don't have anything like major like that. Well, it's interesting because we know the average time for keyword research and the average time for, you know, setting up a wicked awesome Google ads campaign. And, you know, Mm, SEO always takes longer than we think, right? Because yeah, there's there's a lot that goes into it. So the communicate clearly and often. We so this is where we kind of excel in some ways because we send those video reports. Now we need to build that in to our costing because our first clients aren't really paying for that, but they see such value and it keeps them informed of what we're doing. Um, that you know we have a high retention rate. But I mean, yeah, so that's what we not only do that, we'll have we have monthly meetings with some clients. Um, we do a meetup at one of our clients locations. And so we get to see them every month, which is really good. And so I think seeing your clients every month is smart, like the smartest thing you can do. Right. Um, in my opinion, though. Uh, so that's the communicate clearly and often. I mean, one of the hardest parts is there's you know, acronyms and, and um, specialty terms. I forget what you'd call those specialty terms um, in every business, right? So getting clients used to how you talk because you just, we just rattle off things like CSS and, you know, and cost per click and things like that. And so, um, so maybe giving, maybe giving a terms list might be good. I don't know. Would you do that, Greg? Mm, yeah, maybe. Right. Depends how big the project is. Look, look, look. I got the bell going. Wait, wait. Oh, no, it didn't work. Ah, oh, it's locked. Oh. Hummer. Hold on, hold on. Wait for it. Yeah. <laughs> so funny, Greg. <laughs> okay. Um, the last one is set realistic project expectations. Okay, tell me about this. How do you do this? Um realistic project expectations mm -hmm. well again it's all going to come back from that clearly defined project scope that you're going to do if it's if it's well defined mm -hmm. 
the customer knows exactly what they're going to get from you. Right, right. But what if the customer isn't listening? So you have it written out, like the the expectations, the, yeah. yeah. Well, then what are you quoting? I mean, the customer needs to tell you mm. what they want. Sometimes Unless they come to you and say, like, give me a website, you know, tell me what it's going to take. And you just go off and just define your own scope mm. and say, this is what I feel like doing for this client and send it to them. And they just like, like the price and say, OK, yeah, uh, I like clearly defined outlines for most things I do now. Right. Like I make a plan to make a plan sometimes. I know it's amazing. <laughs> I don't like doing things wrong. No way. Um, <laughs> so, so I would never do something like that. Like, oh, I want a website and just like come up with a proposal of what most people need for a website. You still need to talk to your customer and say, okay, that's very general. This is what I suggest you need in a conversation. You know, we'll, we'll do this. We'll do that. We'll do that. So the customer knows what you're saying you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And then you propose it in a proposal with a cost and then they agree. So they, they should always know what you're doing. If they don't know what you're doing, like something's wrong from the beginning. Yeah, that's true. Right? Well, some clients don't want anything to do with their marketing, right? As we've discussed, the hardest part of being a marketer. Uh, Manjid has joined us. Let me know if I said your name right because I would love to know that. Um, yeah, there's that uh, realistic project expectations. I think it's... Um, you know, this is where you can excel because you can go over and above um, because you can set out the expectations, but in your head, you can have other expectations, right, for yourself. So what, because, you know, what is that over deliver under promise? Yeah, 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 that's, that's gold, right? So I like that. Oh, we got some love for that. Um, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a good point is that you can, you should over deliver all the time and you can gauge how much you want to over deliver by and what uh, over delivery means to you right well yeah so, well i mean over delivery is giving the customer more than they've actually asked for um so you're going above and beyond to make that customer happy um and i do that constantly mm -hmm. and i and i know i do that and my customers like um, when I do that and it leaves everybody happy and I can control how much more service I give because I find, I, I mean, my rate is $75 an hour. It's not the highest in the industry, but it's definitely not the lowest. And I feel I get paid good money to do what I do. So I do try to over deliver, um, and make sure every client I have is happy. Mm. I don't think you charge enough for your skill set, but that's just me um, because I know that you fix things that I break. You're like failing, you know, so there are things I cannot do that you can do. Um, and so you might get those desperate calls sometimes. Of, oh, my God. Um, Greg, I can't believe it. We're out of time. Like I was like, oh, we got 15 more minutes. We don't. We're like, it's it's done. Um, I'm not going to say your name. Men, Menjid. Uh, said I almost got his name right, so I'm going to message him to figure out how he says his name. So usually I'll send a messenger and get you to do a video recording or a verbal recording so I can I can get the pronunciation. Uh, Greg, do you mm -hmm. know what we're talking about next week? Mm, you'd think I should because I just did the graphic, right? But I don't recall. Right? Um, Paul hey, Paul. See me next week because he knows that I have committed to uh, a BNI thing. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's interesting. <gasps> Ooh, you know what we're talking about next week? Ah, social media post strategy. Right. So um, this will be really fun. I can't wait to hear other people's opinions because we definitely have a strategy. We have a keep the lights on strategy, um, which really is it is effective. Um, but we'll talk more about that next week. I hope you guys can join us 11 a.m. Thursdays Pacific. And uh, yeah, we're going to give Greg the gears and see if he does people's social media. Yeah, yeah, right? So, hey, Greg. Yeah. Don't get captured. All right, make good choices. Bye, guys.